Good morning. I call this meeting to order. We are joined on the dais today by our colleague, Congressman Jim Matheson from Utah, who will introduce one of our witnesses. Mr. Matheson is a lead sponsor with Congressman uh, Charles Bustani of Louisiana of the House bill to repeal the provider's fee. As of this week, I believe that bill has over 150 co-sponsors, and I am proud to be amongst them. Thank you for your leadership, Mr. Matheson. I want to welcome all of our witnesses. We look forward to your testimony. A special thanks to Dean Norton, President of the New York Farm Bureau from Elba, New York, which I am honored to represent. Today, we meet to examine the health care law's new annual fee on health insurance, which was included as a way to finance the health care law. Beginning in 2014, the law assesses a fee on health insurance providers, which across the industry totals $8 billion and increases to $14.3 billion in 2018 and will continue to increase every year thereafter. The Nonpartisan Joint Committee on Taxation estimates the fee will exceed $100 billion over the next 10 years. Both the Joint Committee on Taxation and the Congressional Budget Office said they expect a very large portion of this fee to be passed through to the purchasers of insurance in the form of higher premiums, driving up the cost of insurance for families in all regions and small businesses in all sectors. Why is this a problem for small business? The health care law exempts self-funded plans from the fee but it applies to fully funded ones. Small business owners typically do not have a large enough pool to self-insure, so they face the higher premiums in a fully funded group plan, precisely the plans to which this tax applies. Of course, small business owners with more than 50 full-time equivalent employees do have the choice not to offer coverage, but then they pay the $2,000 per employee employer mandate penalty. In fact, a March 2013 study released by the National Federation of Independent Business Research Foundation estimates the fee will raise the cost of employer-sponsored insurance by 2 to 3 percent in 2014, imposing a cost of nearly $2,000 per family by 2020. The study also predicts that the price increases caused by the fee will reduce private sector employment by up to 262,000 jobs by 2020, with the majority of the losses falling in the small business sector. We're pleased to have a witness from the NFIB here today to discuss the study's findings in greater detail. We will also hear from small business owners about the burden of the fee. The Joint Committee on Taxation has said the fee is essentially an excise tax based on the sale price of health insurance, so it is not tax deductible. The Joint Committee estimated that repealing the fee will uh, be the effect of stopping the 2 to 2.5 percent increase per year, and eliminating the fee would reduce the average family premium in 2016 by $350 to $400, which represents the increase that would otherwise occur. To put this issue in context, we note that according to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce quarterly small business survey, the numerous requirements of the health care law are now the biggest concern for U.S. small businesses, bumping economic uncertainty from the top spot after the past two years. These are the small businesses, our nation's best job creators, that we are relying on to bring our still anemic economy back. They are the same small businesses whom we are asking to shoulder more and more mandates, taxes, regulations, and cost increases. Again, I want to thank our witnesses for being here today, and I now yield uh, to Ranking Member Hahn for her opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So before we deep dive into examining the possible impacts of this one part of the health care law, it's important that we step back and, and I think remember that um, the Affordable Care Act has done a lot uh, to make health insurance more affordable, more dependable, and more meaningful for American families and businesses. Under the Affordable Care Act, children can no longer be denied coverage because of a pre-existing condition. Parents can keep their son or daughter on their insurance until age 26. Insurance companies are forbidden from canceling a policy for someone who's gotten sick or been hurt just because they had a typo on a form a decade ago. 
If an insurance company spends too much of the money it's paid on things that aren't about quality health care, it has to refund its customers. The ACA empowers small businesses in the health insurance market through the exchanges and offers significant tax credits to support health insurance for some of the smaller uh, small businesses. Millions of Americans are already feeling the positive benefits of the Affordable Care Act in their health and their pocketbooks. Now, of course, I think there are ways that we can improve this law. I, for one, think we might have to do something to bring these hospital charge master list prices into the light of day. But as we move towards the implementation of some of the biggest components of ACA next year, there, there may well be some things we need to do to adjust and correct issues that come along. Today, we're examining how one component of the law, the tax on health insurance companies, may have an undesirable impact on consumers, including small businesses, in the form of increased premiums. As we examine the problems this fixed fee could pose, it's important to understand the origins of the provision. It was meant to raise $90 billion from insurance companies, not their customers. With the insurance mandate poised to deliver millions of new customers to insurance companies, it would seem fair to ask the insurance companies to pony up some of the cost of the law that was going to give them so many more millions in customers. However, these companies threatened to recoup the fee from consumers through increased premiums rather than absorb the fee themselves. Because higher premiums present a real risk to small employers in their ability to invest and grow, I'm glad we are investigating this issue. We're looking for feedback to see how likely increased premiums are due solely because of this section in the, floor, in the Affordable Care Act and what they would mean for our businesses. But at the same time, we must recognize the difficulty presented in our tasks due to the number of major insurance market reforms that also become effective next year. These consumer protections, in conjunction with exchanges, are expected to alleviate the continued rise in premiums over time. Market forces will have a major impact on how insurance providers react to being assessed a premium tax, while also being asked, tasked with implementing other insurance reforms. Accordingly, this hearing will not only explore the burdens of higher premiums, but how, also how the health insurance tax will interact with other provisions contained in the ACA, like the medical loss ratio and rate review panels. Just as with any other legislation that brings major changes, there has been much speculation about the positive and negative effects the ACA will have, particularly to our small businesses. For this reason, it's important that we consider all aspects of the health insurance tax before acting prematurely to eliminate it entirely. At a time when we're facing budgetary burdens, we must work to come up with a realistic remedy. The unintended consequences of the health insurance tax on small employers could affect their ability to provide affordable health insurance while also growing their business. This hearing serves as a starting point to examine this issue and start a dialogue so we can address it immediately. I want to thank all the witnesses for being here today. I look forward to your comments, and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Ranking Member Hahn. We're uh, going to have votes probably at 10.30, 10.35. I think we're going to have plenty of time to get through the opening statements of our four witnesses, at which time we will have to adjourn until after votes, and then we will uh, come back at that point in time and continue. So I just wanted to make that clear. Also, to explain the uh, timing lights to our witnesses uh, in front of you, you each have five minutes to deliver your testimony, and the light will start out as a green light, and with one minute remaining, the light will turn yellow. And finally, it will turn red at the end of your five minutes. And if you could try to keep your time within that, uh, we would appreciate that, especially with our voting schedule coming up. Our first witness is William Dennis, Jr., who is a senior research fellow with the NFIB Research Foundation in Washington, D.C. I referred to some of the studies reports in my opening comments. Mr. Dennis has directed the NFIB Research Foundation since 1976. Uh, welcome, Mr. Dennis. Uh, you have five minutes to present your opening testimony. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm accompanied today by Michael Chow, who's a senior policy analyst with us who actually did the um, simulation itself. So if we get too deep in the weeds, why I have my technical expert with me. Um, I also uh, am going to strike some of my initial comments, since you very well described what, the, what we're talking about here and that kind of thing. But let me just kind of summarize what the health insurance premium tax is. It has four characteristics. It's large. It's highly inequitable. 
it's non-transparent, and it cascades. And so, in effect, what it does is raises the costs of, for smaller businesses. It worsens their competitive position, and ultimately, it gives those uh, those small business owners without health insurance another reason for not providing it to their employees. The simulation which we have is attempt to determine the economic impact. We used a BSIM module of something called the REMI model. Now the REMI model is a very standard common model used by many folks. To give you an example, we not only use it but the AARP, NEA does. Um, MIT has been a client for a, for a while, University of Michigan. Um, the Democratic Policy Committee or on the Senate side has been. So it's a generally well-recognized uh, model. Uh, as we proceeded with it, there are lots of moving parts when you try and estimate things like this. And what we attempted to do with these moving parts is to, as much as possible, be conservative in, in their use. By conservative in this case, I simply mean that we tried to minimize any potential extremities that would occur and use conservative assumptions. For example, we assumed that there would be constant employee or employer offer rates, that they wouldn't change. That's an arguable thing, but that seems to be the most reasonable thing we have. And there are other uh, similar uh, types of things, such as the constant distribution of insurance types, same number of family policy, same number of individual policy, plus one policy, so forth. There are, the question, an initial question was what was the, what will the tax rate actually be since it, it wasn't initially put into the law as a, a particular rate. And we didn't feel we had the expertise so we relied on um, two sources to come up with our estimates. We uh, used the Joint Tax Committee and we used uh, Doug Holtz Eakin's um, uh, estimate. And of course, he's the former chairman of the uh, House Budget uh, uh, House or Congressional Budget Office. I'll get that right yet. Uh, and so we used 2.5 and 3 percent, and and simulated both those. Um, we also used different rates of premium uh, inflation because that's a matter of dispute. Uh, no one knows quite what that's going to be as time goes on. Uh, some are arguing it'll be relatively low. Some are arguing it'll be relatively high. So we use basically 5% annual increase to 10% annual increase with increments in between. These results yielded um, a total uh, estimate of 146 to 262,000 lost jobs, 59% of which would be in small business. It's also a cumulative loss of up to $184 billion in lost output. So it's, an, it's a significant impact. Some would argue it could be bigger, but it certainly is significant. And the numbers that I've just given you include all the feedback that comes from the reinvestment of the money. So in effect, we've also included not only the jobs lost, but the jobs that would be gained through health care and things of that nature. So in sum, what we're doing is we are collecting and spending $100 billion of a highly inequitable tax to yield essentially a quarter of a million lost jobs and what, $175 billion to, 200, uh, to $200 billion of lost GDP over a decade. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, thank you, Mr. Dennis. At this point, I would like to yield to Representative Matheson, who will introduce our next witness. Well, thank you, Chairman Collins. Thank you for holding this hearing. It's particularly important for small business because, as you know, this uh, premium tax applies to fully insured plans. It doesn't apply to self-insured, which are more large corporations. So uh, I'm glad the committee is holding this hearing. And you mentioned my role with Mr. Bustani on the legislation to uh, repeal this particular tax. Uh, my purpose in being here today is to introduce a good friend and a constituent of mine and someone whose family has known mine for a number of years. Uh, Ryan Thorne is a health underwriter. Uh, from South Jordan, Utah. And there he has serviced Utah small employers for over 30 years, and he is a small business owner himself. 
Um, he served in various capacities with the National Association of Health Underwriters, and he is currently a vice president of that organization. It is fair to say that Ryan has a great understanding of the small business marketplace and the mechanisms at play that affect business costs. And I think his testimony and answers should be very important for this committee to hear, as this is someone who is balancing the books for his own small business, and he is also providing health insurance and consultation to other small businesses as well. I have always found him to be a very forthright individual who has provided me with good information over the years to help me understand the issues. I am pleased he is here today to testify for this committee, and I will yield back my time. Mr. Thornton, if you could uh, deliver your opening remarks. Thank you and good morning. <clears throat> My name is Ryan Thorne, as mentioned. I do own an insurance agency in South Jordan, Utah. I am self-employed with one part-time employee. I am here on behalf of the National Association of Health Underwriters, or NAHU. I have been involved with NAHU since 1993 and currently serve on the National Board. I help my clients purchase health insurance coverage and service their benefits all year long. Almost all of my clients are self-employed or have less than 25 employees. I would like to thank the House Small Business Committee for inviting me here today and for my Congressman, Representative Jim Matheson, and also my Senator Orrin Hatch, as they have both sponsored bills to repeal the annual fee on health insurance premiums included in this law, which will have serious financial consequences for Utah businesses and consumers. While technically paid by the carriers that issue individual and fully insured coverage from 2014 on, Utah insurers have confirmed back to me that the tax will be passed down to consumers. The direct impact on premiums will be staggering. I have included Utah's data in my written testimony to each of you. But in short, it averages out to be about $500 per year for families and $200 a year for individuals. It disproportionately hits individuals and small business owners, the people who have been hurt most by these challenging times and this tax never goes away. Among my clients, the cost of health insurance is a huge concern. In preparation for today, I contacted several of them to share their thoughts. One longtime client wrote, We have always tried to take care of our employees, but it is becoming impossible at this rate. Another explained, We currently pay 75 percent of insurance premiums for all of our employees and their families. We have historically provided this degree of benefit because of our strong commitment to our most valuable asset, our employees. Frankly, Obamacare's multiple hidden taxes, such as the HIT, scares the daylights out of us and threaten not only our ability to provide adequate insurance coverage for our employees and families, but also the very existence of our company. The bottom line, the ACA and its national health insurance sales tax is causing tremendous anxiety for American employers. One of my clients said, Freedom brings happiness. I just don't find happiness anymore from what the government is doing to me. This tax has no purpose but to increase federal revenues. It doesn't make the markets work better or target poor behavior choice, such as smoking. It's a huge expense for individuals and small businesses, larger than the, than the device and pharmaceutical taxes combined. The members of NAHU and I believe it's inherently unfair to finance health care reform by taxing people who are doing the right thing by buying private coverage. I've made my living for nearly 30 years helping people buy private health insurance. So I know when prices go up, people buy less or simply forego coverage altogether. I'm afraid this tax and other cost drivers will incentivize the younger and healthier people not to buy coverage until they need medical care. The resulting adverse selection will make the cost of health insurance even higher for everyone. The impact of jobs will be huge. Another client said, the activation of this law and tax will likely prevent me from hiring new employees. Besides not hiring, employers will change jobs from full-time to part-time status, since most part-timers are not offered benefits. Of course, this is to the detriment of the employees whose hours will be cut. We are simply going in the wrong direction. Finally, on a personal note, my wife, my wife Robin and I spend just under $500 a month on our $4,000 deductible family HSA policy, which is a significant expense. Due to other ACA pricing changes, premiums will be going up an average of 28 percent next year for Utah families like mine. That's on top of the HIT tax and other fees. 
Factor in the law's MLR requirements, which, by the way, decreased my personal business income by 30 percent, it's hard to call this law the Affordable Care Act, at least in the Thorne family. I consider an honor to have been invited to share these thoughts with Congress today and the impact this hit tax will have on small businesses and individuals. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Thorne. Uh, I'd now like to yield to Ranking Member Hahn for the introduction of our next witness. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's my pleasure to now introduce Mr. Paul Vandewater. Mr. Vandewater is a senior fellow at the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, where he specializes in Medicare, Social Security, and health coverage issues. Previously, he worked at the Congressional Budget Office for over 18 years. Welcome, Mr. Vandewater. Uh, thank you, Ms. Hahn, for that kind introduction. And Mr. Chairman, I'm pleased to be here with all of you this morning. The Affordable Care Act will extend health insurance coverage to 27 million people and help ensure that Americans have access to affordable coverage. And it will do so in a fiscally responsible way. In fact, the Congressional budget estimates that health reform will reduce the deficit, modestly in its first 10 years, but substantially in the following decade. To pay for this expansion of health coverage, the ACA levies taxes on or reduces Medicare payments to businesses and industries that will directly benefit from health reform. The fee on health insurance providers, also known as the health insurance tax, falls into this category. The fee does not apply to large employers that self-insure, those that pay the cost of their own employees rather than purchase insurance in the commercial market. This is reasonable since most large employers already offer health insurance and will be largely unaffected by health reform. As with any excise tax, supply and demand will determine how the tax's burden is ultimately split between providers and purchasers. Insurance companies have recently turned in very strong financial results and thus are well positioned to bear some of the tax. But a portion of the tax is likely to be passed on to consumers. The Joint Committee on Taxation, as I think another uh, witness has mentioned, estimates that premiums subject to the fee will be 2 to 2.5% two higher than they otherwise would be. But that is only part of the story. As Congresswoman Hahn mentioned in her opening statement, health reform also contains many provisions that will slow the growth of premiums. The new health insurance exchanges will increase competition among plans and create economies of scale. Standardization of benefits and prohibition of medical underwriting will reduce administrative costs. The individual mandate will help bring more healthy young workers into the insurance pool. Premium increases of 10 percent or more are subject to state or federal review, and insurers must provide rebates to their customers if they spend less than 80 percent of premiums on medical care. The ACA also includes a large number of initiatives to identify and implement more efficient ways of delivering medical care services. All things considered, the Congressional Budget Office estimates that health reform will slightly reduce premiums for employer-sponsored health insurance in the near term. For employers with more than 50 workers, CBO estimates that the law will reduce average premiums by up to 3 percent in 2016 compared to what they otherwise would be. For small employers, the estimated change in premiums ranges from an increase of 1 percent to a reduction of 2 percent. And for workers and firms that can benefit from the ACA's tax credit for small employers, the cost of insurance will drop by 8 to 11 percent. Now claims that the health insurance tax in particular or health reform in general will kill jobs are unfounded. The Congressional Budget Office foresees only a small net reduction in labor supply primarily because some people who now work mainly to obtain health insurance will choose to retire earlier or work somewhat less, not because employers will eliminate jobs. And if you'd like in the questioning, I'd happy, be happy to illustrate, uh, indicate why I think the, uh, uh, the problems are with the study from the NFIB. In conclusion, the health insurance tax forms part of a carefully thought out structure to expand health insurance coverage and slow the growth of health care costs without adding to the budget deficit. Any effort to modify or repeal this tax must not under undercut any of these three crucial objectives. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Uh, Vandewater. Our final witness is Dean Norton, 
who is President of the New York Farm Bureau. Mr. Norton is a senior agricultural consultant with Freed, Maxic, and Battaglia, a uh, local CPA firm in the Buffalo, New York, Western New York area. He is a constituent of New York's 27th Congressional District, which I am honored to represent, and his family owns a dairy farm in Elba, New York. He is testifying today on behalf of the New York Farm Bureau. Welcome, Mr. Norton. You have five minutes to present your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity to appear, to appear before you today on what is a serious concern from my farm, my neighbors' farms, and those all across this great country, the hit tax. Ultimately, it will hit me and my employees in our wallets and shrink the health care coverage my family's farm is able to provide. I am the fifth generation of Nortons to farm on the same plot of land in Elma, New York, dating back to 1906 and my great-great-grandfather Bloom. Old Corcha Dairy encompasses 1,000 acres of cropland and we milk about 900 cows a day. We also have a custom trucking operation for forage and commodity harvesting, and my wife Melanie and I operate DMCK Cattle Company, which leases cows back to neighboring dairies. In addition, it has been my privilege, as has been mentioned, to serve as the President of the New York Farm Bureau for the last four years, and I also serve on the American Farm Bureau Board of Directors. A recent Congressional Budget Office report confirms that the hit tax would be largely passed through to the consumers in the form of higher premiums for private coverage. My family's farm and countless of other small businesses will bear the brunt as consumers. Small businesses are the backbone of the American economy. Farmers are small businesses, and many of us offer health care coverage for our employees. Most farmers and other small businesses do not self-insure because we do not have a large enough pool of employees. Instead, small family farms like myself purchase health insurance on the fully insured market, which the hit tax is levied on. And that is why we are going to feel the full force of the hit tax as the health insurers pass on the cost to family farms. It is expected to cost, as has been mentioned, $100 billion over the next 10 years. That translates to $400 more per family per year. That's a hit that many families cannot afford. You're talking about money that could buy a month's worth of groceries. And don't forget, those of us in rural areas already pay a disproportional share of health care costs than those who live in urban areas. Keep in mind, these costs are only going to make it tougher for our farm to operate. Dairy farming by nature is highly unpredictable. We have no control over the price of milk, which varies greatly from year to year. Also, the price of feed for our cows and fuel has been rising rapidly, as have the, the farm's health costs. Health care costs for small businesses have doubled since 2000. Imagine trying to budget with all those uncertainties every year. In order to keep up with the rising expenses of employer-provided health insurance, we have been forced to trim costs. It was necessary for the farm to significantly change the cost structure of our insurance plan. We have turned to a highly deductible policy that only covers 50 percent of the insurance costs at this time. We used to cover 90 percent. In turn, our employees now have to contribute a larger portion of their income when they seek medical attention. And I think we could all agree that this can be a disincentive for people to seek care in some instances. To compound the problem, we now only cover half of our employees than we once did. And keep in mind, this was all before the hit tax. Now we have to reevaluate our health insurance coverage again. Do we want to offer less health care coverage? Absolutely not. Health insurance is a benefit that we need to attract high quality, dependable workers. Milking cows is a seven day a week business, 365 days a year. Without our hardworking employees, we would have no family farm. For our trucking business, it runs during our very short harvest season. We're missing out on a single day can mean the difference between profit and loss. It is very important we are able to offer reasonable health insurance if we are to obtain the workers we need to stay in business. Just as important, it is good for our employees, their families, and our communities that we keep them healthy. The hit tax will hurt the very people that it was intended to help. It means that it will be harder to afford health care for my family, my employees, and for farms across this country. In conclusion, I would encourage, encourage all members of the House Small Business Committee to be sponsors of the bipartisan bill H.R. 763, introduced by Representative Bustani from Louisiana and Representative Matheson from Utah. This bill re repealed the annual fee on health insurance providers that was enacted by the Affordable Care Act. I appreciate the opportunity to share my story, and I look forward to your questions.
Thank you, Mr. Norton. We'll uh, start the questions as we watch the clock to see when uh, we may be called out to uh, vote. But I think uh, from hearing the opening testimony, uh, a, a good opening uh, debate comment might be concerning whether or not insurance companies will in fact attract so many more customers that their profits will skyrocket to the point they don't have to pass much, if any, of this tax on to the consumers, which, as I understand and paraphrase Dr. Vanderwater's uh, comments, was one of the reasons that this tax is levied on, on the uh, private offerings uh, that most small businesses offer because, in fact, uh, they're going to get so many new customers, they'll make money, and they'll be able to absorb a large part of this. So uh, maybe I'd ask each of you to comment because I know my own observations are, uh, especially concerning the young and the healthy, now that the companies cannot charge more than 9.5% of their W-2 wages, and Mr. Thorne, you might comment on the fact there is no longer just a pure single policy. Those policies have to include the uh, dependents of the family. So we used to have single family. Now we've got single plus dependents, which is a more costly policy, and then the wife or the spouse come on board. So you might speak to that. My concern is just the opposite. There will be fewer and fewer policies. The young and the healthy will, in fact, understand that they can drop health insurance altogether. And because there's no uh, penalty for pre-existing conditions, um, you know, why would they have health insurance at all? And also, companies are likely, as I've talked to them, take uh, employees, drop them to part-time so they won't get insurance, which certainly would have fewer policies. And then, uh, you know, lastly, uh, the cost of the penalty at $2,000 is less than most companies pay, and you might see a, a significant number of companies dropping health insurance again, which actually would reduce the number of customers, not increase them as Dr. Vanderwater uh, testified. But, you know, all four of you in good open debate, and that's why we're here. If you could comment on some of those, uh, start with Mr. Dennis. Um, first of all, I think there, a lot of us are, are operating on um, a good deal of speculation, quite frankly, um, because what, what we have seen as time goes on is that we keep asking small business people what they're going to do and so on and so forth. A lot of them really don't know what's going on yet. Um, but those that, that we engage and talk to tell us, indeed, that um, of those that don't have it, they're, they're less likely to have it. Those that do um, are casting about for ways to get out from underneath a lot of this. Um, most of them don't want to get rid of their health insurance. But um, I think over the longer period, by come push to shove, um, it's our judgment that in all probability it will decline. How much? I don't know. Uh, thank you, Mr. Dennis. Mr. Thorne, as someone who is selling these policies, we'd be interested in your comments. It's interesting as I, as I meet with, with clients every day, and, and the, the underlying concern is the uncertainty, as was just mentioned. They're literally scared to death as to the unknown. I mean, they're trying to do the right thing for their, cut, for their employees. But they're looking at this huge expense going, How, my margins are already so thin. Bring on another 500 bucks hit tax, sure, I'd love to. It, it just is not going to happen. And I think part of the problem, and, and as I talk to the carriers, in my state anyway, they did indicate it will be passed on to the, to the consumer, to, to, the, to the small employer owner. And, uh, and, and so I think we have a trickle-down effect. So if, if that tax is passed down to the consumer, and all of a sudden we've got more people opting out because uh, I can't afford this anymore, that 500 bucks just put me over the edge, you're going to have less revenues coming into the insurance carriers, okay? So that's going to be a, a trickle-down problem. Um, I, I also see from my own experience you've got a lot of small businesses who are looking at cutting hours, the opposite of what they really want to do. And uh, instead of being able to, to, to support a full-time family and give them a good, decent wage, in order to, to fit their own budgets, they're going to have to cut their own hours down. So that, that's going in the wrong direction as well. well I share the concerns. Uh, Dr. Vanderwater, if, if you could comment. Uh, certainly. Uh, as I said, Mr. Chairman, I think there does seem to be a consensus among uh, economic analysts that at least some of this tax will end up being passed forward to uh, consumers. The Joint Committee on Taxation, whom I cited, which is Congress's nonpartisan staff agency, has estimated an increase of about 2 to 2.5% two in premiums if one were to look at the effect of this tax by itself. Uh, so I think that I, I 
think is uh, we can take pretty much as a, as a given. But the point is there's a whole heck of a lot of stuff going on as well. I was really taken by Mr. Norton's comment that his uh, insurance costs had gone up by uh, – had, had doubled, I think you said, over the past 10 years or so. Uh, that's a huge increase. In relation to that, a 2% tax is pretty small and can easily be swamped by these other factors uh, in the Affordable Care Act that I, that I mentioned and that Ms. Hahn referred to. Uh, as far as whether insurance companies are going to get more business, I think there's, uh, there's virtually no doubt that they're going to get substantially more business. Again, relying on Congressional Budget Office estimates, you see huge increases. And again, knowing that uh, um, it's going to have a fellow witness from New York, I uh, just came across a study yesterday from the, the state of New York about the growth of the uh, small group and the non-group market in New York. And uh, this was done, by, I think, by the, the consulting firm of Deloitte. They estimate a huge increase in uh, non-group uh, insurance in New York of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, ten, ten, over tenfold, and a, a, a modest increase, but an increase nonetheless in small group coverage. So again, I think that uh, the, the consensus there is overall there will be a very substantial increase in uh, insurance coverage and in, and in business for uh, commercial insurers. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vanderwater. Uh, Mr. Norton? Uh, yeah, it's been uh, my experience in the agriculture industry that any time a regulation or a mandate has uh, been passed down to our suppliers or vendors that eventually I'm the one that ends up paying for that tax or regulation. Um, so I would say that there's probably a good chance that, yes, we will be doing this. Um, we were all talking about the uncertainty. And uh, I would just mention that uh, I know of at least two farmers, Mr. Chairman, in your district, uh, because of the uncertainty of immigration reform, because of the uncertainty of the Affordable Care Act, uh, the hit tax, and what does it mean to their business, uh, they have taken, I would consider, drastic steps. And they've moved away from being a specialty crop uh, growers and by special crops made fruits and vegetables like cabbage, cucumbers, uh, apples, and whatnot. And they have made the decision that this year they're going to move away from growing those type of highly labor intensive crops because of the uncertainty with all these rules and regulations and immigration reform. And they're going to go to a mechanized type of agriculture or corn, uh, soybeans, something that can be uh, planted and harvested with machines. And to me, uh, that's a loss not only to that farm, but you're talking 30 employees that won't be employed by a farm. You're talking about thousands and thousands of dollars that are not going to be in the community anymore. Um, so to me, this uncertainty is already uh, having drastic effect on what is happening in the agricultural community. Uh, thank you, Mr. Norton. Again, one of the reasons for the hearing is to talk about uh, what might happen. Again, no, none of us know for sure. And uh, you know, that's why I think the public deserves, and we're having this hearing today, to, to hear various uh, uh, potential outcomes. And uh, with that, I'd like to yield to Ranking Member Hahn for uh, her opening question. Thank you. Uh, and, I, and again, it's this, it's, this is an important hearing uh, that we can uh, really analyze uh, what some of the, the impacts are of, of the Affordable Care Act. I will say... Uh, I've been having in my district uh, workshops with my small businesses specifically on uh, ACA because there is so much misunderstanding out there. And frankly, I would dare say there are outright lies being put out there with, in some of the media outlets about really what this means. Uh, so I've been holding workshops uh, so that we can walk small businesses through what this means. Now, in California, we're ahead of the game because we're – uh, we're ready for the exchanges. Uh, we're we're on top of it, and and it's we think it's going to be valuable and beneficial to small business. And let's remember, less than one percent of small businesses will be under the mandate of uh, the Affordable Care Act to provide health insurance. So, uh, but that doesn't change those of you who want to provide health insurance, which I applaud, uh, and then what this new tax will mean in, term, in terms of higher premiums. Well, what I want to do, uh, Mr. Vandewater and, and Mr. Dennis, is maybe talk about that huge disparity that both of you talked about in terms of job losses as a result of, of this, um, I don't know if it was a result of ACA or a result of just this tax. 
uh, want to hear that. And, you know, by the way, we, when we're talking about job losses, uh, we, we've been told that sequestration uh, will result in 750,000 uh, job losses. So, uh, you know, that, you know, around here, there, there are some decisions that have been made that have resulted in job losses. Uh, so let's, on top of that, I'm really interested to know what the big disparity is on the number of jobs uh, you think will be lost as a result of this. And maybe, you, Mr. Vandewater, you kind of said you would be willing to sure. explain <clears throat> it. Um, the, as, as I indicated, the Congressional Budget Office has taken a look at the overall effect of the Affordable Care Act and has concluded that the effect on employment overall would be uh, negligible and, in fact, to the extent that there is any effect at all, it would result from the fact that some people who are, in effect, hanging on to jobs in their uh, older years simply to hang on to health insurance coverage would be able to, uh, uh, you know, re retire earlier, spend more time with their grandchildren, whatever, because they would have alternative sources of health coverage available that weren't tied to their, to their employment. Now, it, with regard to the NFIB study, obviously the, the model that, with it, that they use is very, uh, is very complicated, and I can't say that I can follow all of the, the, uh, the moving parts, but I have a couple, uh, uh, a couple of suspicions of what's, uh, 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 of, of what's going on here. First of all, uh, although Mr. Dennis talks about uh, you know, the, the proceeds of the tax being invest, reinvested, it's not entirely clear to me that, that the, the model is taking account or the assumptions that were input into the model are taking into account of all of the spending that results from the tax because of the extent that there's money that's being collected through the tax but, not, but being spent yet, not, yet ignored in the model, uh, you, could, you could end up with a job loss because of that. Uh, I'm also concerned about uh, what the model is may be assuming with respect to the effect of uh, uh, premiums on uh, wages. Again, you know, as, as an economist, I would, you know, uh, you know, believe that uh, to the extent that people get health insurance coverage, that's part of their uh, compensation package. Uh, it's a compensation just like wages, and to the extent that employers are paying more compensation in the form of health insurance. Uh, over the not too many years that people will end up with less cash compensation. So to the extent that compensation is unaffected by the, the cost of health insurance, as I think it would be, uh, it's very hard for me to see why there, you know, th this particular model should produce anything in the way of job loss. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's an interesting um, angle to talk about the people who really only have jobs for the health insurance as being one angle of that. I had a friend who got married to the wrong person just so she could have health insurance. So we'll also have a lot of less bad marriages as a result of this. Mr. Dennis, explain. We, uh, we didn't model last, <laughs> the, the bad marriages, I'm sorry. <laughs> but um, yeah, the, the first thing on the, the spending uh, item, uh, yes, it all is required by the, law, by the way the thing is constructed that you have to put it all back in. Uh, you have to put it back in in the industries in which it's presumed it will go into. So we assume that this would be spent most part on health care with a little bit on insurance, I believe is the way we put it together. So that answer is, is yeah, there is, is all spending. The second thing is the idea of pass-throughs uh, pass of these things in terms of, of lower compensation. Uh, and so, in effect, we get a net wash on that. And there's some truth in, in that. There's only, uh, and again, I, I can't do all the technical, you know, uh, equations and all that sort of thing they got in there either. But I, I think there is an allowance for that. Um, and some of it goes through and some of it doesn't. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, thank you. At this point, I'd like to yield to Representative Hules Camp for uh, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I didn't know we'd get to questions uh, before we went to vote, uh, but I appreciate the opportunity. Gentlemen, thank you for being here. I appreciate the opportunity uh, to uh, visit with you. And first, I want to read a uh, constituent email I have received and uh, ask you a few questions about that. And, uh, and dear Tim, or dear Congressman, I appreciate all your efforts uh, against the health care plan. And, and now, more so than ever, I want to tell you my story in case any personal stories uh, will help you in, in your uh, fight against that horrible law. 
and this is from Kathy. I was recently notified by my insurance company that they will be closing their doors, going out of business on December 31st of this year due to the Obamacare sledgehammer that will be coming down on everyone as of January 1st, 2014. Not only am I losing my and my children's insurance coverage, I'm losing people who have become my friends. And then she describes uh, this insurance company was uh, with uh, with the family throughout a, 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 a loss of her husband uh, through cancer. And I, I, and this is just not an out one letter we received. This is something I received from, from many folks of that uh, she was happy with her health insurance coverage, and she has lost that. And we talk about uh, the facts and figures that are in here. Uh, one thing you can't change are these stories are folks that like their health care plan. Congressional Budget Office estimates that uh, 7 million Americans will lose their employer-based health care coverage. Apparently, uh, even if they liked it, they don't get to keep it. 7 million. And that, that's an impact of uh, what happens here. Uh, one thing I want to ask a question is this uh, $100 billion dollar tax increase, which I've signed onto the bill to, to do away with that. Uh, I, I think uh, the doctor here is supportive of that. I would guess the other three are not. Uh, but, Mr. Doctor, a question I have, the $116 billion dollar tax increase, you support that. Uh, do you think that was not high enough or just about right? Uh, you're under the impression that this, this tax increase is good for the economy, good for the health care sector. I want you to describe uh, the reasons uh, for your support of that uh, and, and what it means for uh, Americans. The, the importance of the health insurance tax is as one of the ways of paying for uh, the expansion of coverage and health reform. Uh, I personally think that it's a very uh, important uh, a benefit. It's a very exciting development that uh, all Americans going forward will have access to health insurance coverage regardless of their uh, health status, regardless of their employment status. Uh, I, for one, think that you know I want my children to have access to health insurance. I suspect that all of us want our children and friends to have access to health insurance, and I think the Affordable Care Act will do that. And that's why we have this tax along with the others uh, in health reform, not because we like any one tax in particular. No one likes taxes per se. We raise taxes to raise revenues to pay for things that we want to pay for. And in this case, we're paying for an expansion of health insurance coverage to 27 million Americans. Would there be alternative ways of raising that revenue? Of course there would. Uh, and uh, if the Congress can come up with an alternative, uh, uh, so be it. But what do I tell Kathy, who who lost the plan she liked, Doctor? It was taken away from her. She had a decade-long relationship with this company, and it's worked well for her. And you've come in here with this law, not you or the Congress and the President, and said, sorry, that's no longer a choice you have anymore. And she's very upset about it. What what, what do I tell her? Well, there's no evidence that, that, that the, what's happening to this company is, is, is a result of this particular tax. The law is a, is the impact that caused this. Now, I mean, you can argue with Kathy and argue with uh, uh, her experience with her insurance company, but the impact of this law is the company she liked, and uh, as well, seven million other Americans have health insurance coverage. You're going to lose that. Have to go into a plan they don't like. I mean, what am I supposed to tell those folks? Just say, hey. It's a great thing. Enjoy paying the tax, but you don't get to keep the health insurance as promised. I think the, 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 health in, the health reform law has become a convenient excuse for people to use. We don't know that this company is going out of business because of the health reform law. Companies, uh, small businesses we know. Uh, I'm not going to argue with, uh, with Kathy, who lost her health insurance coverage and in making this claim, her insurance company. She was happy with that. This company is going out of business. But again, That's not a statement of that. because of health insurance. Uh, and I we don't know uh, that. Well, one thing you do not know, doctor, is the fact that I'll note here, you, you, you use data from 2009 to make your claims. CBO has updated many of this, much of this data in here. The 7 million, do, do you not agree with the CBO that 7 million Americans are going to lose their employer-based health care coverage? Do you disagree with that? S some people will. You don't you you disagree with up to 7 million Americans? This is coming out of the CBO. I don't remember uh, offhand if that's the right number. Well, you might look up the latest reports because one, one point in here, and I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, but uh, when you come here and you use something from 2009 
and say this is about this is which year, particular year before this passed two thousand nine citation are you concerned well, about? You, you have the citation, sir. It's in your report, and you, you talk about uh, the, the impact citation of is this still health accurate. insurance. The, the the nothing I have said that's based on CBO two thousand nine. Uh, has has changed in CBO's view that I know of. I'll be All happy of to states. share uh, that with you, uh, sir. Uh, the CBO has changed. They now estimate that that the cost has doubled. That's the estimate of the CBO. And the seven million lost seven million figure is, is not new. I mean, this is a few months out here. So I just say there's some information out there, and I appreciate if you'd share the most up to date information from the, the CBO. Twenty seven million figure I used is the most recent number. Well, how many will still be uninsured when this is fully implemented? Um, About the same percentage that were uninsured before we started this. I yield back, Mr. Absolutely Chairman. Absolutely Thank you, Mr. Hulskamp. Uh, voting has been called, but we do have a few more minutes. Uh, so in the interest of uh, maybe uh, cutting it a little close, which is okay, I'd like to uh, yield to Mr. Schneider for his question. Uh, and, and I'll be brief, but uh, I, I've spent the, the bulk of my career working with small businesses. I own businesses from 97 to 2003. I owned a small insurance agency. And I know from my experience, with both personally and, and, and many of my clients, uh, the, the bane of looking to the future is uncertainty. As you talk about the uncertainty, it makes it very difficult. Uh, but I also know uh, from my experience and the experience of my clients that we were seeing double-digit increases in health insurance premiums going back. And as we were making choices, uh, that was one of, in my per own case with my partner, that was one of our greatest uncertainties every year, is what was going to be the increase in health insurance. And for a small business, uh, we had our peak 10 employees. That was a very difficult challenge. So as you look at uncertainty as we go forward, what do you see? You know, we need to get through to the other side of, of, of the complexity of health care. But to provide a greater certainty, once we get there, once people know what they're doing, do you think people will start hiring again? Do you think we'll start moving in the right direction again? What's the impact long term that, that concerns you? Well, are you talking about uncertainty in the, in the abstract or with, with regard to the particular thing we're talking about here, health care? Well, uncertainty in the abstract makes it hard for businesses to plan yeah. in yeah. general, but specifically with health care, this is, once we get it set, they will know what they have to do. Well, clear, clearly uncertainty has been a major, uh, what can I call it, a drawback or dampening, uh, had a dampening effect on small business employment. It probably has also had a dampening effect on entry, too, although we can't prove that nearly as much. Um, longer term, one has to assume that it, if you um, reduce that uncertainty, and uh, it will take a lot to do that, um, that indeed employment will, will be much more likely to um, stabilize in the, uh, in the sector. Uh, small businesses still struggling. And um, a good bit of it is that rather than um, hiring in anticipation, you know, expecting certain positive things to happen and I, therefore I'm going to hire, uh, it's almost the reverse happening. You have to force them to hire. In other words, things have to be so tight that uh, that's the only way you're going to hire. And that's the feedback we've been getting for a long time now, and it seems to continue. All survey stuff would also show that, um, that uh, uncertainty is a huge Right. Factor. Do, uh, do, you, do you get a sense, and I'll close with this question, do you uh, get any sense in your surveys that uh, small business employers with access to exchanges, with access to a more stable market, will feel that they have the opportunity to hire more people down the road? We don't have any survey data on that one way or another. We hope to begin to start collecting some of it soon and to be able to give you a, a, a better answer on that. Let me put it that way. Right. I'll yield my time. Uh, thank you. Uh, in the interest of uh, continuing to cut it close, uh, we yield to uh, Mr. Lukemeyer for his question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> um, with regards to the exchanges, uh, Mr. Dennis, uh, the, the President's already waived off the competitive part of that for another year or two. Is that not correct? Yes. Can you explain a little bit about that? You mean that there will only be one plan? Right. Right. Now there'll be one rather than three. That so as a result a of that, uh, where's the competition that's supposed to be driving down price? Well, you wouldn't necessarily have to get your your, your insurance through the exchange. 
I mean, you could, but okay. you don't necessarily have to. So presumably what, there will be other plans. What kind of there. effect is that going to have on the small business folks trying to find insurance? Well, <laughs> it will be, I mean, they'll have fewer opportunities than they would and have what, in the what past. That, what does that usually mean you have fewer opportunities? More expense and, More expense. and less, less um, quality, let me put it that okay. way. Uh, one of the things that I've talked with my small business folks at home is that <clears throat> Whenever um, they're looking in, in the in the uh, the forty to one hundred and fifty range about how they're going to, with employees, how they're going to be able to afford this, you know, they're looking at going to part time with some of these, going temps and some of these, even dividing their companies in two, having two separate companies to try and slip underneath this. Uh, whenever these people are going uh, go down to twenty eight hours or thirty hours, or whatever it is, uh, those people are going to find insurance on their own. Is that not correct? Yeah. Okay. I think. If if you're a young person that's being laid off and you're uh, and you're healthy, uh, Mr. Thorne, what's your experience with young people who have to make a choice between paying rent, making a house payment, uh, paying car making car payments, paying the rest of their insurance, and now they have to figure out how they're going to afford health insurance on a reduced budget? What's your experience with that? <clears throat> Or go on a date. Now go on a date. Yeah, and, and, and the young, healthy immortals, we call them. Maybe they'll uh, get married like Miss Han's uh, friend, maybe. Let's, let's hook okay. them up. There you go. No, I think that's a very real concern. And, and, and in our state of Utah, we've had uh, up to age 26 for a long time, for a number of years. So part of the ACI, I think that's a good thing. I look at a lot of these young kids who are going to school. The last thing in the world they can afford is health insurance. Be able to stay on their mom and dad, that's a good thing. But for those young folks okay, who well, let's, don't have let's that. take let's take a single parent with with a child or two. You're thirty, thirty some years old, you've got a you know, you're you're a wage earner. You can pick you can pick out whatever occupation you want to, but you're a wage earner and suddenly now you don't have your reception is at a at your insurance agency, for instance, and suddenly you get your hours cut back and you've got two employees, let's say now you cut them both back twenty eight, so you've got part time employees, you have to don't have to supply their insurance for them. What happens? What's the economic effect? When people have less money to spend, Mr. Dennis. Well, I mean, if you have less money to spend, you don't purchase things, right? Well, yeah, and you're going to prioritize them. Let's put it okay. That way. If you have less money, and if insurance is taking more money out of your pocket, and you have less money to spend, that's less money to spend in the rest of the economy, is it not? Um. Well, someone's got it somewhere. I mean, the, well, the insurance companies are going to take it out and send it to the government. So the government's got it, right? Exactly. Okay, so where does it, where where is the economic benefit of this? Or is it going to be a plus or a minus? Well, I'm I'm getting a little lost on some of this. I'm sorry, sir. But um, uh, okay, my basic where where I'm yeah. headed with this is the insurance costs are sucking more money out of the right. economy. There's less money for the individuals and businesses to spend, right? And therefore, there's going to be less money spent in the economy. So the effect would be. Well, I'm not. No, no. The less, there won't be any less money spent. It will be who is spending it and what is being spent on. Okay. Uh, who, who can best spend a dollar? The government well, or private sector? I'm and very, get a better return on. I'm it. very much biased toward the private <laughs> sector. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your honesty, Mr. Dennis. Um, I, I think that you know. In the interest of time here, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll stop there, so we need to go vote. But again, I thank you each for being here today. I appreciate your willingness to uh, spend some time with us and give us some real-world examples of some of the effects of this, this tax on small business. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, in the interest of getting out to vote, we will adjourn this uh, briefly until we're back. It could be 30 to 45 minutes. There are a few more questions, and I think uh, to get those on the record, we will uh, reconvene after voting. I thank you for your understanding, and we'll be back as soon as we vote. This meeting is uh, temporarily adjourned. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we call the uh, hearing uh, back to order, and in the interest of time, I'll certainly uh, defer to minority uh, ranking member uh, Hahn for a couple of questions so she might catch her flight. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. So, uh, Mr. Vandewater, what, the ACA included provisions requiring rate review panels and the medical loss ratio requirements, both intended to protect consumers. Can you please explain the interaction between the health insurance tax and consumer protection provisions like these? Uh, yes, thank you, Ms. Hahn. Um, the, as discussed before, the, uh, the medical loss ratio provision is designed to make sure that consumers basically get good value for their insurance premium dollars, that, uh, for, um, uh, that in the uh, 
you know, the, and the, so the requirement is depending upon you know the details of the policy that either 80 or 85 percent of the premium uh, be paid out ultimately in in benefits. Now, my recollection is that this particular tax that we're discussing today, the health insurance tax, um, uh, uh, is uh, you know is included for purpose of meeting the medical loss ratio, so that. Um, uh, you know, to the extent that that's passed forward, that uh, you know the consumers still have to pay the you know can be forced to pay some of the you know some of the health insurance tax. That is, that the medical loss ratio provision doesn't protect them from uh, having part of this tax passed forward, uh, but it will provide uh, a lot of help to consumers uh, generally. In fact, uh, you know there are a lot of consumers who already received rebates on account of the, the medical loss ratio provision. So that even though it doesn't protect them from the health insurance tax in particular, it is a, a, a good protection, generally speaking. Thank you. Yeah, we actually had a witness here, uh, I think last month, that actually talked about already having received uh, fifteen hundred dollars uh, in a in a rebate check that she was saying really was helping to keep. Afloat uh, uh, her her expenses at that time, so she was very happy to get that. Yeah, and of course there are a lot of other provisions of uh, health reform which ha will be affecting premiums as well. But during your uh, our intermission, I was uh, Mr. Thorne and I were having a a good chat, and we were agreeing that uh, in the long run, the most important thing that needs to be done is to control the rate of growth of health care costs. And that's not something that's peculiar just to public programs like Medicare or Medicaid, but it applies obviously to uh, private uh, insurance, the self-insured you know, self uh, employers, small businesses that purchase uh, commercial products, individuals. Uh, and of course, the ACA uh, takes a number of steps that we hope are going to help slow the growth of health care costs in the long run, although we also know that it's just a beginning and that more is going to have to be done. So let me, one of the things that we haven't talked about is the, the uh, premium tax credits that ACA has included, which will provide assistance in buying health coverage. And these subsidies can actually lower monthly health insurance costs for many people. And despite uh, insurance companies recouping the health insurance tax through higher premiums, do you think it's possible that these premium credits will help keep premiums affordable? For, for most people? Well, for those companies, for employees of those companies that can take advantage of them, yes. In my prepared statement, I mentioned you know, the CBO estimate that for uh, em employees of that sort in, in firms that can take advantage of the credit, that the net reduction in premiums might be on the order, due to the Affordable Care Act overall, might be on the order of, on the order of 8 to 9 percent. Now, I think we all know, I'm sure your committee is very well aware that you know, because of cost considerations, the reach of those small employer credits is somewhat limited. Uh, it apply, they apply only to very small firms and to those with, uh, you know, quite low uh, wage levels. But for the firms that can take advantage of them, there'll be a big plus. Uh, I just have a few questions to uh, uh, finish up, and you know, I, I again thought. We were only talking about the medical device tax, but in, in fairness to all here, I do subscribe to the Max Baucus definition of Obamacare, calling it a train wreck. Uh, we don't know what we won't know until uh, January 1 of 2014, but I'm of the opinion, frankly, uh, 100 billion here and 100 billion there and 40 billion here and 40 billion there actually is real money, even for the federal government. So 100 billion, the health insurance tax, another 100 billion on the employer mandate, another 40 billion, and we had testimony just a few weeks ago from Dr. Aiken who was saying if a small startup medical device tax isn't profitable and they don't make 2.3 percent of, of profit based on revenue, they go out of business. All those jobs are lost. Striker. A hundred million dollar tax on my medical device alone already has laid off a, a thousand workers cutting back on R&D. They're a public company. They need to protect their stock price and they can't absorb or pass on a hundred million dollar charge. So. Again, I would, would say with some bias, I agree with Max Baucus, it is a train wreck. But a couple of questions maybe to finish up in Mr. Dennis. Uh, the NFIB is known for advocacy uh, for small business. In fact, I am a member of the NFIB in all fairness. 
Uh, do you think, you know, I think I know the answer, that the annual fee d threatens small business expansion and job creation? Just interested in your opinion on that. Yeah. Um, surely, whenever you get something like this, why well, it's always something that you have to pay. And um, the more that you have to do, the less you're able to put an investment somewhere else. I mean, it's, it's a matter of choices. You either pay what you have to pay uh, or don't, um, or you invest or, or don't. Um, it's pretty, that's pretty simple, and the question is just how much. Thank you. Uh, one other question for Mr. Dennis, and something that I am very concerned about, I believe, in competition. I think competition works. I don't think the government should pick winners and losers, and I don't think the federal government should uh, uh, put small businesses at a disadvantage, whether it's currently today a higher tax rate, marginal tax rate for pass-through entities than we have for big corporations, 39.6 percent for small business, 35 percent for big corporations, the first time I know of in history that s small businesses are taxed at a higher rate. But this is, I'm more concerned about the fact that uh, a lot of big corporations, most are self-insured. Yeah. So my worry is on the competitive impact, a lot of small businesses, certainly they compete product line by product line with big corporations. Uh, they see a niche and they want to step in. But since big corporations are not subject to this tax if they're self-insured, so you could argue, and I think Dr. Vanderwater even said it may not have a lot of impact on some of these big corporations. Uh, but this tax is placed on those group plans that small businesses subscribe to. So now uh, this, and whether it's small, medium, or large, but a chunk of this health insurance tax, there's unanimous agreement, will be passed on in the, in the form of higher premiums. It, it seems to me it's just one more competitive cost disadvantage that the government is deliberately, deliberately passing on to small business, which will have a chilling effect on competitiveness. So, I, again, that's yeah. a statement, and I just would like your comments, Mr. Dennis. Well, no, I mean, I, I think that that's one of the uh, – if you look at the tax per se and forget the size of the tax and all this stuff, one of the most egregious things about this, this particular form of tax is that it's highly discriminatory. I can't imagine it, it being in some other context than this one because it is so egregious. Um, and as a corollary, of course, it's a hidden tax. It's a non-transparent tax. So, you know, it, and then thirdly, if you want to put, add that, it's a cascading tax, and that is it becomes a tax on a tax um, at, because it's rolled into the premiums. So it re in terms of just tax policy, I can't think of a tax that's probably much worse than this. Uh, if you give me some time, I might be able to. But, <laughs> but, but this kind of does a pretty good job of violating a lot of important principles. I think a prior witness would say that uh, the medical device tax is right up there with us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Mr. Thorne, now this is a little bit technical, but you know, in, in peeling back the numbers, I'd like to ask you, as I understand it, this is an excise tax, so it's not tax deductible. So if the insurance company uh, has to provide, uh, call it a $1 uh, fee to the government as an excise tax, that comes off of the bottom line for for-profit <clears throat> insurance companies. So in order to get there, it's not that they're going to be passing on a dollar, they have to pass on $1.50. So they're going to have to actually pass on to the consumers and small businesses a $1.50 increase in order to have a dollar left because the increase in the premiums is tax taxable event. They're going to pay $0.50 cents in tax to the federal government, which is money uh, going out. That then leaves them with a dollar. Then they send that dollar to the federal government as an after-tax excise tax. So if I, you know, as an insurance broker, I would ask, am I reading this correctly, that a $1 increase, a $1 health insurance tax equals potentially, certainly for the for-profit insurance companies, a $1.50 being passed on. So it's even worse. I just would ask your comment on that. Mr. Chairman, you're absolutely right. Um, uh, the, the, the bigger issue, too, is the fact that um, you're going to see a lot of insurance companies who are uh, creating or developing self-insured policies down to five to ten lives, which is also a potential train wreck in and of itself to avoid this very, very tax. And I'm hearing uh, stories of that happening. 
So we, do we really want to go down that road as well? I, I, I think there are so many problems with this tax itself, and it is dispropor disproportionately being affected by the small employer groups. Yeah. I mean, if, if you're going to spread the tax, it should be amongst everyone, not just a certain population. That, that's a concern I have. Uh, my last questions are for uh, Mr. Norton, and uh, the Farm Bureau has a lot of issues. I mean, just next week we're marking up the uh, five-year farm bill that was deferred, should have been done last Congress, but that's another comment. Uh, so you have a lot of issues, dairy issues, insurance issues, and so forth, and yet you're here today uh, saying that one of the top issues for the Farm Bureau is, in fact, repealing the health insurance tax, and just would like your comment on, on how it is you've prioritized this given so many other issues. Um, well, uh, as you mentioned, we do have a lot of issues, but this is you know, front and center uh, one of them because, honestly, uh, without some of the employees that we have to help us on our family farms and our family businesses, uh, we wouldn't be in business. And uh, it's imperative of us to be able to take care of them, provide them health insurance. So, you know, the hit tax, you know, as it's very well named, uh, is going to affect us and whether we're able to have employees, whether we're able to uh, provide the health insurance that we want to to them, and whether, you know, some of our members might actually take the drastic decision to either get out of farming altogether because of it or change their model. So um, our members felt very strongly about uh, the Affordable Care Act. Uh, we've been opposed uh, to its mandates from the beginning, and this is one of the issues that, you know, we're here to work on. And, and I'm sure you deal with the other farm presidents around the country, so uh, certainly New York is New York, but uh, could I get your comments on whether your counterparts across the United States share the same view? Well, I'm, I'm one of uh, 51, including Puerto Rico, and uh, as you well know, we get together every year and have a, uh, a meeting of delegates to decide our policy, and um, this was one of those issues that we discussed and decided in January, and uh, we all agree that it's important that we take care of this issue and that we speak up about the cost that uh, this mandate is having on us and what it's doing to our farms and possibly driving us off of our farms. And, and certainly the Farm Bureau is a nonpartisan, bipartisan group. Yes, nonpartisan, bipartisan. We work with both sides of the aisle. Um, just last week I was having a conversation with Senator Schumer on immigration reform, so uh, and I'm very well aware that you and Senator Schumer are not on the same side of the aisle. All day, so. <laughs> you think? <laughs> uh, anyway, I want to thank the witnesses and uh, Ms. Hahn. I don't know if you ha have a couple of follow-up questions. Yeah. Certainly, uh, well, not so much follow-up, but you know, I just feel like I, I need to go on the record to say, you know, it's the insurance companies who, by the way, the last time I checked, were making huge profits. CEOs of insurance companies are making millions of dollars, and once again, we're letting the insurance companies run health care. I mean, that's why we have the Affordable Care Act, because insurance companies in this country, instead of the doctors, were telling people what kind of procedures they could have. You know, one of the reasons I ran for Congress, because I had one of my best friends died of breast cancer about 20 years ago, uh, because at that time, bone marrow uh, transplants were considered experimental, and her H HBO did not... Uh, uh, allow for a, a bone marrow transplant. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to run for Congress because I want to make sure that people don't go broke in this country because they have to decide between health care for their families or paying the bills. And the last time I checked, these medical device folks were also making huge profits. And by the way, this ACA is going to probably allow for more of these medical devices to be uh, approved because of, of uh, in, this, uh, this insurance uh, mandate. And, you know, with all due respect to, to the member who had his, his constituent, Kathy, and I'm sorry for Kathy that she lost her insurance, what insurance company is closing their doors when we are mandating in this country that everybody buys insurance? Uh, they must have a pretty bad business model. Uh, there's hardly any other product that we are mandating that people buy. Why insurance companies? would close their doors when more, more people in this country are going to have to buy an insurance company. I don't know. I just felt like I need to go on the record to say, once again, we should be angry at insurance companies, not at this law. They're once again trying to hold people hostage. Uh, and uh, I just read where uh, CEO of one of these medical device 
uh, companies was making $25 million uh, as a bonus at the end of the year. So I'm not feeling too bad for insurance companies right now or medical device companies. I do want to listen to our small businesses, and I'm going to continue to listen. If there's places in this law that we need to tweak and we need to make better, I will. But let's direct our anger where it is appropriate, and that's with these big insurance companies who are still raking in huge amount of profits and, and millions of dollars and, and leaving people like Kathy uh, to fend for themselves. Thank you very much. I yield back no time. Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you. I mean, we all know we can agree to disagree, right. and, and in many cases we do. But in, you know, in, in answer to a couple of things, I have a medical device company in my district, Corbell, and, and they happen to make that device that makes the bed go up and down and turns the television on and off and calls the nurse. Now, that is a medical device, and the medical device tax will impact their profits in a draconian way. 2.3% of revenue, and as Dr. Aiken said a couple of weeks ago, a very successful company makes 5% of revenue on the bottom line. That's how business works. 2.3% is taking away half their profits. And as we know, a lot of startup medical device companies, that's where they come from, they don't make any money or they make a very small amount. So there are examples of very successful medical device companies that make 10% of revenue on profit. But 2.3% is still wiping out 25% of their profit. Stock prices are based on a multiple of your profit. That means the strikers and the great batches and the other companies are either going to have to see their stock price plummet by 25%, or they're going to have to cut. We're already seeing the cuts. We're already seeing the layoffs. And wishing it so doesn't make it so. And the idea that insurance company, that we have a mandate here, the problem is, what is a mandate? You must do something. Well, that is not what the ACA is. Because for $95, an individual can beg off. And for $2,000, a company subject to the ACA can simply deny coverage. The young and the healthy, if they don't subsidize the sick and the old, and I think there's everyone that understands it's the young and the healthy paying into a system that subsidizes the old and the, the frail. All of a sudden, the penalties for the young and the healthy not having insurance are gone. Because when you think about it, $95 is their penalty, $2,000 from the employer, and yeah. there is no longer a penalty for pre-existing conditions. So there were folks who got insurance because they were afraid if they came down with a a, a condition. They could lose their house. They could lose this or that. There is no longer a penalty for pre-existing conditions. There's a $95 cost to get out. And if the insurance is $15,000, I am afraid, only time will tell, and Mr. Thorne hopes this won't be the case, you're going to see the young and the healthy dropping insurance like there's no tomorrow because there's no ROI, so to speak. I've met with the American Health Insurance Providers Organization. They're already seeing the young and the healthy drop their insurance because the cost is very low. The risk is no longer there. And all I can tell you is, in, in my case, I buy a new car, I get collision insurance in case I wreck the car. Now, if you told me after I wreck the car, I can sign up for insurance, I'm not going to get the insurance until I wreck my car and I won't be buying collision insurance on my new vehicle, and there's a big correlation with that in the ACA. And we'll be seeing how this plays out, uh, but it, it's not as easy to use the example of insurance companies making millions. I can assure you in western New York that is absolutely not the case, and I can absolutely tell you our CEOs don't make $25 million. But, again, we'll set that aside. I want to thank the witnesses uh, for coming here today. This is certainly a controversial topic. Uh, we're going to see how this plays out. This is just one more step in, in getting four great witnesses to give us uh, input. Uh, some of it we agree on. Some of it we'll have to see how it plays out. The subcommittee will continue to monitor the implementation of this health care law and the impact on small businesses. I'm sure we'll have some other hearings. And following this hearing, I do plan to send a comment letter to the Department of the Treasury on the proposed rule they're in charge of implementing the fee. So with that, I ask unanimous consent that members have five legislative days to submit statements and supporting materials for the record. So without objection, so ordered, this hearing is now adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.